Today, this morning, the title of the message is 666, The Mark of the Beast. People that don't even come to church, they know that 666 is the, the mark of the beast. And hello to you youth that are with us today. Thank you for hanging out with us. You will be able to understand what's going on today. And I encourage you, uh, those of you online, towards the end of the message, we'll have uh, a few videos that we're going to, uh, to show and a few things we're going to talk about. So you want to make sure you stay for the duration of, uh, of the message. If you happen to ditch church last Sunday, let me give you just a little um, background of what you missed. Uh, last week, we spoke of the rise of the Antichrist. We talked about this man will be demon-possessed he will receive his power from Satan. He will rise from the sea of humanity and he will achieve world dominance. He is going to have an assassination attempt uh, upon him and he is going to be healed miraculously and the whole entire world is going to marvel. Today, we're going to learn about another beast. Yes, another beast. And he is called the the false prophet. So we have on the scene Satan, we have the Antichrist, and now we're going to have the false prophet. When you get to Revelation chapter 13, give us an amen. amen. And those of you that are new to following you some Jesus and reading your Bibles, welcome to the family. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. So we're in Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to start at verse 11. And it says this, Revelation chapter 13, starting at verse 11. John is the writer of the book of Revelation, and he says this, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13. He performs great signs so that, even, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is... Six, six, six. And the church said, amen. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. So let's talk about this beast. John says he saw another beast coming out of the earth. Remember last Sunday, the uh, first beast came up out of where? Anybody remember? The sea. Good job. This beast is going to come up out of the earth. These, this first beast and second beast are very similar, but they, are, um, they have that same message. The second beast is subordinate to the first beast. Uh, the first beast was very, uh, very political. This second beast, this false prophet, many believe he is going to be a religious leader. Some commentators believe uh, it could be a pope or the Catholic Church that, um, that is being spoke of here. Um, you can imagine there's probably what, a billion Catholics, um, maybe even more. And um, the Pope is saying some pretty interesting, non-biblical things as of late. So I'm not saying the Pope is this false prophet, but this false prophet who will come on the scene will be a religious 
leader. So we want to keep our eyes on uh, what's happening. Or some believe that it could be an uh, Islamic leader, this false prophet that we're learning about today. Jesus says this regarding false prophets in Matthew 24. He says, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Anybody ever been deceived before? When you were deceived, that individual or individuals probably told you a little bit of truth, right? They gave you a little bit of truth, but everything else was a lie. So they deceived you with a small amount of truth. There is a lot of deception that is going on today. Uh, depending on what uh, news channel you watch, you can watch one news channel and go, Ooh, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Oh no, all that's happening. And then you can swatch, uh, switch to the channel to another news station they said, what? What's happening? What's going on? Well, who's telling the truth? It's, it's so hard today to go, wait a minute. It all sounds like it's true. They're passionate, but somebody's lying, right? Somebody is purposely deceiving the people. And we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, later on. So when we have deception, there's always a little bit of truth shrouded in deception. This is why it's important, family, that we, we follow this word of God. There's no deception in here. It is complete truth. Well, the Bible goes on to describe this uh, false prophet, that he has two horns like a lamb. This two horns means that he has power and authority of Satan. Or it could simply mean he has two horns like a lamb. And here's a picture you'll see on the screen. I didn't know that lambs had horns. Am I the only one? Some of you guys are going, yeah, lambs have horns. I'm like, lambs have horns? I learned something new this week. Thank you, Jesus. So this second beast, the Bible says, spoke like a dragon. This means the first beast and the second beast that they have the same message. But this second beast is called the false prophet. So we have on the scene, we have Satan, we have the Antichrist, and now we have the false prophet. We have what is called the unholy Trinity. Listen to what David Guzik says. The dragon is the anti-father. The beast rising from the sea is the anti-Christ. The beast rising from the land is the anti-Holy Spirit. Interesting to look at it that way, right? So let's look at this false prophet. Let's look at his actions. What does he do? Verse 12 says, and he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. And he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What does he do? Verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now we're thinking, wait a minute, that sounds a lot like Revelation chapter 11. You guys remember God's two witnesses? Let me read to you a little bit of what the two witnesses did. It says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anybody wants to harm them, what happens? Fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. So God's two witnesses come on the scene. They're talking about the gospel, about Jesus Christ, about sin, about redemption. Fire comes down. They're able to, fire, uh, fire is able to proceed from their mouth. The world kills them leaves them in the street for three and a half days. This Antichrist causes fire to come down from heaven and the world worships him. We have fire on both hands, one talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and one talking about deception. The world follows this and rejects this. You're thinking, how can that be? Uh, truth is preached and proclaimed, signs and wonders are done, but the world kills the two witnesses. Signs and wonders are done. You are made to worship the beast and the world follows. Doesn't make sense, right? You're going, they're talking about Jesus and about the gospel. Fires proceeding from their mouth. But 
They kill the servants of God, but they follow the beast. Family, if you and I aren't lovers of truth, if we're not lovers of God's truth, we're going to find ourselves on the wrong side. Because if we have fire from both sides, the question is, what's the message? The message is the gospel from God's people. The message from this Antichrist, this false prophet, was to worship the beast. Hmm. But the world kills God's people, follows satanic people. That's crazy, right? You're thinking, why, why would you do that? It's interesting that whenever God does a miracle, there's always a counterfeit miracle which accompanies it. Let me give you a few examples. In Exodus chapter 7, when uh, uh, Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh says, hey, show me a sign. So Aaron throws his rod down, his, his, uh, his staff becomes a, a snake. Pharaoh's like, ha, is that all you got? Pharaoh caught his sorcerers and his, and his musicians. Uh, hey, throw your staffs down. They threw their staffs down, and their staffs also became a snake. Now, what's interesting is that Aaron's rod, Aaron's snake, ate the other snakes up. There was another occasion where there were frogs that were just invading all of Egypt. Guess what? Pharaoh said, hey, musicians, you come here. Did I say musicians? Not musicians. <laughs> the magicians. They did the very same thing. So whenever God did a great miracle, there was always a counterfeit. So what do you and I do? How do we navigate when we see something great, something that's some kind of great miracle? Is it from God or, or is it from, from Satan? Well, we have to ask ourselves, where is that individual leading us? Is that individual, is that sign and wonder leading us to a greater relationship with Jesus? Or is that sign or wonder taking us away from Jesus? Be very mindful of people saying, I'm awesome, come follow me. I'm uber gifted and talented, just come follow me. If you hear stuff like that, say no. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna follow some Jesus. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 13. It says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, and you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey, obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Listen to verse 5. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord. So if anybody ever says, thus says the Lord, run. Anybody ever pulled a hamstring before? because you're running a little too fast. Somebody says, thus says the Lord, turn and run and just hold on to that hamstring. Uh, the thus says the Lord's are closed, that there's no more thus says the Lord. If somebody comes to you and says, well, I've got a word for you. All, know this, that God will never tell someone something he's not already working on you with. So if you come to me and tell me something crazy, I'm going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. But if it's from God, God is already working on you about it. So that person is just confirming what God has already told you. And if it doesn't line up with scripture, don't believe it. Don't follow it. So we have here in, in, our, in our world, even in our, in our text, that there's going to be signs and wonders that happen. And family, we need to be very careful because we're very um, eye-oriented. Well, just show me, just, just prove to me. There is coming a time when there's going to be literal fire from heaven. We'll have it all on our phones. We'll have it videoed. Hey, did you see what happened? I've got a video. I'm going to shoot it to you. And many people will, will follow that. But the question is, where is that going to lead you? Closer to Jesus or away from Jesus? If there is a sign or a wonder done, it sh and it's legit from Jesus, it should lead you to a closer walk with Jesus, not away from Jesus. Listen to what verse 14 says. It helps us out. It says, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. I think one of the commandments said we should not have any graven what? 
Graven images. Hmm. So somebody that's calling down fire from heaven is telling you to make a graven image. You'd say, flag. Wait a minute. We don't do things like that. To make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So here is our answer. This false prophet is telling the world to make an image. Listen to what happens in verse 15. He was given, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That image of the beast should both speak. Wow. So they create an image. This sounds like it comes from a movie, right? They create an image and all of a sudden this image now has breath and can now speak. So imagine someone constructing some type of uh, image of this beast. It's just a statue. And all of a sudden that statue now has breath and can talk. It sounds like an AI movie, right? It sounds like something we, we see on, on TV or we go to the movies to see. Now, what's interesting, family, is that this image that is created here will one day be uh, placed in the third temple in Jerusalem. This is what the Bible says about that day, Daniel chapter 9. It says, that ruler will make a strong agreement with many for one week. But when half that time is passed, he will put a stop to burnt gifts and grain offerings, and a very sinful man-made God will be put there. It will stay there until the one who put it there is destroyed. That's Daniel 9, 27 in the New Living Version. Jesus calls this the abomination of desolation, that there's a person that's going to be put in the temple. He's going to make himself or pronounce himself that he is God. So when things are happening in Jerusalem and Israel, that's where we want to keep our mind on. We want to keep our eyes on what's happening in the Middle East. So what is this false prophet going to do? He's going to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That sounds a lot like what Nebuchadnezzar did to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? That if you don't worship my image, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. That's Daniel chapter 3. Whoever does not fall down and worship the beast will be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fire. So there is going to be uh, mandatory worship that is going to be uh, had for the entire planet. If you don't worship the beast, you will be killed. Now, for us believers in Jesus, we will be long gone in heaven with Jesus, so we will not be here for this time. However, if you look at the, the state of Christianity today, what if something like this rolled out in our time? If you don't worship the beast, you're going to get killed. But... If you take the mark, verse 16, he causes all both small and great and rich and poor and free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what if this happened during our, our time, like 2020? Worship this image of the beast. If you don't, you're going to be killed but if you do, we'll put a mark in your right hand or your forehead so you can buy and eat. I wonder what, what Christians would do. I mean, would we really be willing to say, yeah, we're not going to do that. The Bible says, off comes our head. Or will we say, you know what? God will understand. If and when any individual does take the mark of the beast, there is no more opportunities for salvation you have crossed a uh, uncrossable line that it is a done deal. So the believers that are alive during this time will be the tribulation saints. Uh, those that um, are caught or however that happens, they will have a choice to make, either die or, or receive, receive a mark. Now it's obviously for us, uh, we're, we're looking at something that's going to happen in the future. But what happens if this was, if this was today? What happens if this happened to us today? Would we be willing to, to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, that kind of brings things in a whole different, uh, different perspective. I mean, all of us, most of us have come here this morning and we're like, hey, when I leave here, 
I'm going to eat, I'm going to go watch a football game, take a nap, wake up, eat again, get ready for tomorrow, right? I mean, we're going to do something like that when we have, you know, things, uh, 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 we have plans for tomorrow, plans for next week, plans for next year. What if everything changes? What are we willing to do for the gospel of, of Jesus Christ? We're, we're pretty comfortable as, as Christians in America. What if things begin to change for us? Well, we're going to wade into some, some deep waters, and I want to make a few statements before we wade into these deep waters. Please send all of your hate mail attention, Pastor Vince. Uh, he will read all your hate mail. I will not. Um, family, I believe that we are being prepped for uh, this coming ruler. Um, I believe the world is being prepped for a, a one world government, one world currency. Um, and I believe we, we, we see signs of what's happening now. So I want to give an illustration that will help us to understand this point. So I'm going to give what? Are you sure? Yes, I'm going to give an illustration to how we are being conditioned. It's simply an illustration. So those of you that don't always hear rightly, I'm simply giving an illustration to help us see how it's possible that we are being prepped for something coming in the future. Those of you online, I'm simply giving an illustration. So as redundant as I'm being, somebody, did you hear what he said? So I'm free and clear. So you've all seen this picture of no masks, no service, right? So what the individual, what, our, what the world and our governor, government has said is unless you wear a mask, you cannot buy food. You know what's, what, I, what I hate? I get halfway to the door and I'm like, I've got to walk back to my car and get my mask. Back to the message. So, so the entire world now has to wear a mask when you go outside. And if you, if you want to buy, if you want to, if you want to buy something, you have to wear a mask. No mask, no, no service. And again, I'm not saying the mask is the mark of the beast. The mask is not the mark. Don't leave church. I didn't know the mask was the mark of the beast. The mask is not the mark of the beast. But what I am saying is we clearly see how easy it would be unless you wear something, you cannot get food. Try to go into Costco without a mask. The majority of people will get kicked out or arrested. There's a few videos online of that. So we can clearly see for the world has to wear a mask. You cannot go to Stater Brothers or Walmart unless you wear no mask, no service. Again, this is for the, for most of the, the, entire, the entire planet. I believe we are being prepped for what? is to come. I want to read to you. It's called Event 201. And those of you online, you should be able to see the, the links to all of the uh, websites I will quote so you can go research it for yourself. And the same for you guys too. When you go home, go read for yourself to make sure I'm not crazy. Just read it online and it's all, it's all there. Well, this is called Event 201. It happened in October of last year. The Event 201 scenario, the Event 201 simulates an outbreak of a novel zoonotic coronavirus transmitted from bats to pigs to people that eventually becomes efficiently uh, transmissible from person to person, leading to a severe pandemic. The pathogen and the disease it causes are modeled largely on SARS but it is more transmissible in the community setting by people with mild symptoms. It says about event 201, it was a three and a half hour pandemic tabletop exercise that simulated a series of dramatic scenario-based facilitated discussions confronting difficult true-to-life dilemmas associated with response to a hypothetical 
but scientifically plausible pandemic. The exercise uh, consisted of pre-recorded news broadcasts, live staff briefings, and was moderated by discussions and topics. The John Hopkins Center uh, for Health, the World Economic Forum, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation jointly proposed these recommendations. Here's a small video that we want to show you. It's about a minute and a half or so, and then we'll come back. These epidemic events are getting more and more disruptive um, to, to health and to economy. And the reason we call it event 201 is we knew eventually one of those days, one of those events would be the big one. And that big one would really challenge our capacity to respond. And to respond to the big one, we do need to have all hands on deck. Participants are confronted by a hypothetical scenario that um, presents to them the challenges of a response. So we will say, here's a hypothetical disease outbreak. This is the way it might be evolving. And these are some of the challenges that you'll see uh, that you'll have to address to, to address um, the disruptions that you're seeing to your healthcare system or to your, to your organization. stakeholders realize pretty quickly just how underprepared we are and just how much is possible when we work together and that the individual actions of any government or company won't add up to a proper global response I think if so what we again go to their own website and it's it's there so these are my words so I'm not a conspiracy theorist however so you have a simulation in Oc October of last year. And when, when did COVID hit? What? December? So either they're very prophetic or there's maybe something else. So, so, so it's been around for a little while. So it's important for us to at least read and, and look at a few things and say, wow. So you would have a simulation of of a global pandemic, and just a few months later, we're in a global pandemic. Yeah, I'm not saying nothing. I'm simply saying, read, and it's like, hmm, okay. We're in a global pandemic after a simulation of a global pandemic. Very, very interesting. What goes on, and he says, here is wisdom. Let him understand or calculate the, the number of the beast, for his number is the number of man, 666. So we have to ask ourselves, so what is the mark of the beast? Is it, um, is it a tattoo? Is it something in your, in your skin? Um, uh, what is the tat, or what is, a, what is the mark of the beast? Well, I want to show you a couple of more videos and a few pictures. Uh, for instance, how many of you have your dogs microchipped? Whoa, you guys love you some pets. All right. So in case uh, Fiona or Fifi gets out, right, somebody will take Fiona or Fifi to the, the dog pound and they'll scan your dog. And within that chip is all the information about Fiona. You know, she's this, uh, this old and she's had these health issues and she belongs to, you know, John and Susie. So they'll call you and say, hey, John and Susie, we have Fifi. My, uh, my wife uh, had this spawn of Satan dog um, <laughs> several years ago. And you know how you, 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 you love your dogs, right? You know, you feed them, you take care of them, even when they're a little annoying. So whenever the, the front door opened, that dog was gone. I mean, to the point where I'm just tabulating all the money I'm, spend, I'm saving on dog food and stuff. So the dog continued to run away. But some several wonderful people of society <laughs> took her to the dog pound and, hey, we have your dog. I'm like, oh. 
can you please come get it? I was like, I will tell my wife that uh, you have our dog once again. I was like, when I get that dog back, I'm going to find where that chip is so we can fix that issue. <laughs> I would never do that. I don't think. <laughs> so let me show you a picture of the size of a microchip. You'll see it on the screen here. It's the size of a, um, of a grain of rice. So within this, this chip can have all of your information, uh, place of birth, um, any allergies you have, blood type, uh, address, finances. So what uh, has happened years ago is people were concerned with some of their um, loved ones having dementia or Alzheimer's. So what they said was it would be wonderful for us to have a way to, to track or find our loved ones just in case they wandered around and they kind of got lost. There is a company called, uh, I think it's called Vera Chip. They began injecting um, these chips into um, Alzheimer and dementia, patients with dementia. Here's a video that I want to show you that's really, really, it helps uh, and explain uh, this, what we just explained well, The company here. is developing a microchip that could be used to help patients with dementia. Yeah, this Wisconsin company got a lot of attention last year when they started putting microchips in their employees. They use the chips like other companies use ID badges. So now they say they're working on a more advanced version that they say they've gotten requests from people with relatives who have Alzheimer's or dementia. The new device will have GPS technology. They hope to have it ready to test sometime next year. Then they'll try to get FDA approval. And this is years. This is a while ago. So the technology has, is available. They are already injecting people with this chip. There is one company that actually, you'll see it on the screen here, they have a chipping party in the workplace. Hey, so come to work. Guess what? You don't need your keys anymore. You don't need your badge anymore. You don't have to pay for anything with cash anymore. If you want the chip, the chip will be your key. We'll have another uh, video. It's about a minute long. It's about uh, chipping at the, uh, at the workplace. When Elias Brotberger goes to work, he doesn't need ID. And he doesn't need money. In fact, much of what he needs to get through the day is hidden right there, just below the surface in his hand. You like to touch it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, weird. Yeah, it's yeah. like a grain of rice. Yeah, a grain of rice. Embedded in his hand is a microchip that serves as his keys, his ID, and his wallet. Yeah, it's all in chip, so I use it like to get around the building. Buy snacks. Yeah, exactly. Let's buy some snacks. Exactly. So I can't open it. No. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to first blip my chip and it will log me in. Mm -hmm. And from there I get access to the fridge. Popular TV shows like Black Mirror have imagined chips as part of a dystopian future. Install ingrain procedure with local anesthetic and you're good to go. In Sweden, the microchips are already here. The microchip implants use the same technology that's in contactless credit cards. Which have made cash pretty much obsolete in Sweden. No cash. At this tech fair, a chipping event for those on the cutting edge, merging their hands with this new technology. I thought it would be fun, right? The process is simple and swift. A pinch of the skin, and in a matter of seconds, the chip is inserted. The transformation is complete. As for the pain... I barely felt it. But even in this nation of early adopters, not everyone is racing to get chipped. I feel less human. I will feel like a robot. I think. So you see here that uh, what maybe some would, would view uh, this type of chip as no, no, no. Others are like, that's the coolest thing ever. No keys. I can buy stuff by simply scanning um, a chip in, in my hand. And imagine this. Um, maybe you're a new mother. Imagine someone coming to you at the, at the hospital saying, hey, you no longer have to worry about your baby uh, being kidnapped. We'll put a chip in your baby's uh, right hand that you'll know where your baby is at all times. Imagine this. No more kidnappings. The sex traffic will probably go to, down to, to almost nothing. That no matter where you go, there's GPS. Parents, imagine this. Imagine putting LoJack on your kids. You say you're at the library. I don't think so. 
Imagine walking around with a little rice-sized chip in your hand, DNA, bank information. Uh, those of you that uh, use, anybody use Apple Pay? All right, sometimes you go to Starbucks and you just put your, your phone under the little scanner and it just comes right from your Apple Pay account. So you don't even need to carry a wallet. You want to buy something, go to Stater Brothers, Apple Pay, hey, I can pay for my groceries by just with my phone. So imagine someone or the government saying, you know what? We want to help you make life simpler and easier. We want to make sure that everyone is safe. The government will protect you and the government will watch you. Your kids will be safe. Your loved ones will be safe. Here's the way we're going to do it. And as you saw, for some, they're like, hey, that looks kind of cool. I read another article where uh, a man has an RFID chip in his hand. And when he goes into his house, his lights come on. When he goes into a certain room, the room uh, reads his hand and it adjusts the room based upon uh, his, uh, his little profile. Some of you have keys to where you don't need to put it in your ignition, right? Anybody have a couple of you? All right, so if it's just on you, you can push a button. So the reason why I bring all these things to your attention is 100 years ago when people were reading the book of Revelation, they're probably going, no way is this possible. No way is this mark possible that everybody would take the mark. The Bible says that technology, that, or that knowledge would, will increase. We are living in some pretty cool, scary technological times today. That it is very easy when this one world ruler comes on the scene to say, hey, I'm going to take care of everyone's finances. I'm going to take care of the issues in the Middle East. There's just a little image that you need to worship. And there's a little mark that you need to take. Ooh, I don't need cash. Someone's going to um, make it a cashless system. We're going to have one world ruler. We're not going to have all of these issues with political parties. Hmm. Maybe some, well, actually a lot of them would say, sign me up. So family, the technology is here to do all of the things that we have just seen today. They're actually happening now. There's one video that I couldn't show you. There's some folks in a club, uh, clubbing. And um, instead of ladies bringing in their purses, they have been injected with the chip. So they want a drink or something or some food. They simply scan uh, the chip and it goes onto their account. This is technology that is here today. So is the mark of the beast some type of chip? No one knows, but we can easily see how it would, um, it'll be easy to roll out, especially in the times of fear. And speaking of times of fear, we're living in those times today, aren't we? You turn on the TV, death, death, death. Everyone's dying. Everyone's dying. Well, we're all going to die. Yeah. Right. Well, we're all not going to escape that great day. But the world would have everyone fearful. Where do we read here that God's people are to wake up and watch 10 hours of TV and be fearful? Think about that. I wonder how many have had your joy stolen because you're so fearful of what's going to happen. That somehow that, that, that God is not on his throne. That, that somehow this, 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 this issue that we're having worldwide, that somehow God's going, I hope they're doing okay. I hope they're doing okay. I hope they're going to make it. Maybe God is saying, still here. Still here. You can choose that or you can choose that. So my hopes are for, for definitely for the CCB people. Obviously, you want to, uh, to take care of yourself, and we need to, to exercise and do all of these good things. We need to trust Jesus. You're not going to die, and Jesus is going to say, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're early. That's never, ever going to happen. That when you and I go see Jesus, it will be at the right time and the right moment. So I want to let you know, love you some Jesus. Be filled with joy when it's your time to go. When God comes to get me, I will, he will not have to take me uh, screaming and kicking. No, Jesus, no, no, no. I want to stay, I want to stay. My back hurts, my nose perpetually runs. I've got gray hair going everywhere. My ankles crack. Yeah, keep me here, Jesus, please. No, I'm like, let's... Uh, Let's wrap this thing up whenever you're ready. But until then, 
May we live preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we live letting people know that there is hope found in Jesus Christ. Hope is in Jesus. So, so don't, don't live in, in fear. God has got us. Does that make sense? God is taking care of us. So what we get, what we don't get, God has us in the palm of his hand. If he does not, then none of this is true. Then we should be at home watching a football game right now. If God doesn't have everything in control, we are wasting our time right here, right now. But we know that God has everything in control. So there will come a time, family, that we're going to communion, where this false prophet's going to come on the scene. He's going to cause the world to worship this, this beast, or you're going to die. We will be in glory with Jesus. So what do we do, family? One take-home point for you. We need to love our family and also warn our family. Those that are keep rejecting, the, those are family members that say, hey, you guys are crazy. Yeah, this whole Bible thing isn't true and wah, 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 yada, yada, yada. There's going to come a time when this man of sin is going to be on the scene. There's going to come a time when there's going to be a one world government and we can clearly see that things aren't going so well for humanity at this point in time. We can easily see that someone can come on the scene with all the answers and the world will follow him. So you and I must be lovers of truth. We must be lovers of truth. If we're not lovers of truth, we are going to be deceived. And a deception is some truth shrouded in it. It might be a little, a few sprinkles of truth, but we must be lovers of truth. And God help us to love, to love his truth. Sometimes, family, I fear that we are, we are very emotional, that we are, we're so emotional sometimes that we don't always hear rightly. Because the world is always asking, well, how'd that make you feel? You know, did I offend you? You know, are you okay? No, well, we want to make sure that you're not offended. We want to make sure that, that your feelings matter. That's, our feelings get us into trouble. I'm not sure about you, but sometimes my feelings, my feelings are a good preacher, right? And sometimes my feelings just give me a nice sermon. I'm like, hey, feelings, that sounded good. You had some, some emphasis. You had some passion. You let me know, but then I'm thinking, ooh, there's no feelings 101 chapter. Maybe I should just follow truth. If I don't follow truth, I am going to fall for a lie. And if I fall for a lie, most times lies steal joy.